Hello again. John Wesley Brady, This Freedom Wentz, page 80, in his chapter Don Deferred, we've got to the analysis of the state of theater and drama in the days before Wesley's Methodism took root in Great Britain. Brady says Wesley, because of his attitude to the theater of his day, has often been lampooned as narrow, fanatical, and puritanical. But if he pronounced the current stage a sink of all profaneness and debauchery, many non-squeamish contemporaries passed judgment sh judgments equally harsh. Swift's humor was brusque and broad, yet referring in 1709 to current drama, he says, quote, it is worth observing the distributive justice of the authors, which is constantly applied to the punishment of virtue and the reward of vice directly opposite to the rules of their best critics, as well as to the practice of dramatic poets in all other ages. I do not remember that our English poets ever suffered a criminal, um, criminal amour to succeed upon the stage until the reign of Charles II. That would be Swift's generation, around 1700. Ever since that time, the alderman is made a cuckold, the deluded virgin is debauched, and adultery and fornication are supposed to be committed behind the scenes as part of the action." Unquote. Four decades later, William Law wrote his treatise on the absolute unlawfulness of the stage, wherein he declared the playhouse of his day to be as certainly the house of the devil as the church is the house of God. Henry Fielding in Joseph Andrews makes Parson Adams to say of contemporary drama, Quote, I never heard of any plays fit for a Christian to read but Cato and the Conscious Lovers, end of quote, works by Addison and Steele. Sir John Hawkins, too, in his Life of Dr. Johnson, 1787, says, quote, A playhouse and the regions about it are the very hotbeds of vice. How else comes it to pass that no sooner is a playhouse opened in any part of the kingdom that it, then it at once becomes surrounded by a halo of brothels." End of quote. This pronouncement of Johnson's literary executor may seem cruel. In an age of moral awakening, high-minded men are liable to magnify the evils of contemporary life, while in times of spiritual paralysis the same ills may be taken for granted and escape censure. Yet a century after Hawk Hawkins' verdict, W.C. Sidney, reviewing In the Light of History, the middle 18th century drama and theater says, quote, the reader would err, and that very considerably, were he to suppose that it was the attractions of the stage that induced the majority of fine gentlemen in the last century to resort to the three principal theaters of London. Contemporary light literature bears its emphatic testimony to the fact that it was the attractions presented by the saloons of the playhouses establishments which partook as much of the nature of brothels as they did of taverns, which filled the benches of the theatres with visitors, and the purses of those who kept them with coin. The existence of these resorts was the chief inducement for hundreds of men, old and young, to resort to Drury Lane, Covent Garden, and the Haymarket theatres." Lecky says, Quote, the profligacy of the theater during the generation that followed the restoration can hardly be exaggerated. Unquote. That theater, too, was largely the preserve of the aristocracy, and according to Hallam, Steele's Conscious Lovers, that is in 1722, was the first comedy after the restoration which can be called moral. So revolting was the general run of comedies that for decades ladies of respectability and position, whose curiosity led them forth to first nights, appeared in masts. Garrick, admittedly, did much to raise the level of theatrical performances and to popularize Shakespeare, but the liberties he was capable of taking with the master dramatist are amazing. And W. J. Lawrence in The Drama and the Theatre describes the theatrical atmosphere of the era as that of malice, intrigue, and caprice. Most of the acclaimed actresses of the period, too, were women of easy virtue. Anne Oldfield, buried in Westminster Abbey in 1730, lived clandestinely with different men of affairs, while the famous beauty Peg Waffington, who lived from 1720 to 
1760, once said to Thomas Sheridan, Richard's father, that there were two things her sister should never become by her advice, a whore and an actress, for she had sufficiently experienced the inconveniences of those ways of life herself." End of quote. The same Sheridan, describing the said stage idol to William Wyndham, the statesman, pronounced her a most willing bitch, artful, dissembling, lewd, and malicious, but withal a very captivating woman. <laughs> Next time, ignorance, lawlessness, and savagery. 